His article that can be found on ESPN.com entitled The Oddest of World Series Ends with the Most 2020 Moment of the Season. That's uh, the headline that was attached to Jeff Passan's remarkable game story. And the MLB insider from ESPN joins us from the state of Texas the day after that remarkable World Series ends. Jeff Passan, how are you, sir? Rich, I am doing great. How are you, my friend? I am well. I started the show uh, talking about the game, taking it piece by piece, starting with the analytics drama that played out and then the uh, the Twitterverse exploding. I was part of all that. Uh, and then the way everything went from the eighth inning on. But I think that's the way we should start right now. And where, where does everything stand as to how Justin Turner tested the way that he did and the methods that the major league baseball um, powers that be took for it and how he wound up on the field, so on and so forth, Jeff. So let's go through the timeline here, Rich. Um, I think it starts with Monday's testing. So that's on the day of game five Um, and players, uh, personnel, everybody inside the baseball bubble, Uh, take one COVID-19 test per day. It's a saliva test, and it gets sent to this lab in Utah that Major League Baseball essentially retrofitted uh, from a PED testing lab uh, in order to be a COVID testing lab. They've done 200,000 tests over the course of this season, and uh, those tests got sent out there. Now, one thing that I do not understand still is uh, why the results from those tests came back as late as they did typically typically the tests have come back before the game but the results from those tests on monday did not make it back before tuesday's game and so in the second inning major league baseball was informed that there was an inconclusive test with justin turner it showed some signs that it may be a positive but they weren't exactly certain uh around that same time uh the tests from uh, from before game six from Tuesday uh, had arrived in Utah. And uh, instead of rerunning the test from the day before, they said, uh, let's expedite the test from today and see what comes up. And that takes about two hours. So between the second inning uh, and the seventh inning, that test was being run. And in fact, it did come back positive, mm. at which point Major League Baseball called the Dodgers and said, pull Justin Turner off the field. He has tested positive for COVID-19. Now, at that point, uh, Justin Turner or any player who tests positive is supposed to go into isolation uh, and remain in isolation until he can essentially go home, which is kind of a tough thing to do because uh, home is Southern California for him. So uh, he was uh, in a room away from his teammates and was supposed to stay there. And uh, then the Dodgers won the World Series. And when the Dodgers won the World Series, Rich, Uh, He came out of that room. He went onto the field and uh, all of those photos that you've seen of Justin Turner not wearing a mask, sitting next to his manager, Dave Roberts, who's a cancer survivor who also wasn't wearing a mask, um, kissing his wife, uh, you know, all these different things that run afoul of these ideas that Major League Baseball has been preaching ad nauseum for the last few months. Uh, came to fruition on the biggest stage possible and uh, brought up a lot of questions, questions that you have, questions that I still have. Well, and, and you know, uh, just recapping the way I, I started the show as well, I love Justin Turner, man. He's he's just uh, – he's a guy that yeah. um, you, is so easy to admire. Uh, he and his wife yep. have just been so charitable with their time and with their efforts. Um, he is the guy, uh, I guess you would say, the position player – that has been through the most with the Dodgers and is a self-made man. He has been, even yeah. with the Dodgers' postseason woes, he has been the consistent uh, thumper for them. He, uh, It would be horrible for the Dodgers to clinch the World Series and that he's not part of it because he's told in the eighth inning, by the way, you are positive. And I would understand if players are like, well, could it be false? Could it be not? We got to have Big Red out here. So why yeah. not take it out of the Dodgers' hands? Why wouldn't Major League Baseball just basically say, "Sorry, Justin, we'll be the we'll be the bad guy here"? What why what, what happened there? How, how is how did that not happen? Essentially, I believe they tried to do that, and he uh, he essentially said no. <laughs> and, and here's the thing: if, if you're Major League Baseball and you try to 
fine him. It's going to be under the coronavirus protocols, and it's going to be a pretty minimal fine. You're not going to suspend him without the MLBPA saying, uh, oh, no, you don't, and probably winning that grievance. Um, I, I don't know that there's a lot of recourse or repercussions here. And um, it, I, I think part of that illustrates uh, how how flimsy protocols can be if challenged. Uh, nobody's really challenged them to this point, though, because you, you almost would look like a pariah for doing so. And I think in some quarters, Justin Turner has seen that way right now. But I also think that because it was the end of the season and the Dodgers were uh, about to go and party, that the idea that after this month of being in the bubble, that after <sighs> this this year where they had to live uh, like they never had before, and, and listen, that goes for all of us, Rich, so I'm not trying to say that baseball players in any way are unique, but they, they almost felt this sense of freedom and the the idea of them celebrating without Justin Turner um didn't seem right to the players no and and, and, and I could understand they, they I are, could understand that point of view Jeff I I really I, can I I you know but, I in in that and that rich is is sort of the thing that informed the story that I wrote today like on a very human level uh I understand the want and the desire to do that as well. It's it's extremely strong when you've spent your life dedicated to something, you finally achieve it and and you don't get to go out and celebrate it, but on the other hand, I I put myself in that position and and I say what what I do um and and I think personally my decision would have been that uh the, the joy that I get out of knowing that I did it is what I need. And as much as I want to be out there with them, celebrating with them, as much FOMO as there might be, um, it's a greater good thing here. And uh, it's it's almost an example that baseball has said all year long in figuring out how to deal with these things and going almost two straight months without a positive test among players. And I have no idea how Justin Turner uh, contracted coronavirus. I, I imagine it was not because he was running afoul of protocols, but but to see uh, to see him do it in as blatant a fashion as he did. Uh, listen, Rich, if if Justin Turner tested positive for COVID nineteen and remained in isolation, I don't think we would be talking about it right now. And if we did, it would be Justin Turner tested positive. Um, he went into isolation. We're, we're concerned because every human being should be concerned when there's one case that there could be an outbreak with the Dodgers. Let's hope there's not Finn. We'll, well be over. Yeah, it's and, not, and, and I guess that, this is something that's going to linger. If it, well, linger is, uh, again, I mentioned at the top of the show, too, that this photograph um, of, of them celebrating with Justin Turner sitting next to the trophy without a mask on uh, forevermore. You know, when I walk into Dodger Stadium with my kids and – I'll look at it and I'll, I'll think that was the end of the, you know, COVID-19 2020 season and he was COVID positive. And I hope to God that we don't learn that this was a massive super spreader event that put somebody who was in I that know. photograph in the hospital. And then we would look at this I photograph know. completely differently forevermore, Jeff. And, you know, and I, I, again, I, I want to revel in the moment for this organization, which is filled with good people. And uh, I, I don't want to wave a finger, but it's very difficult to to look at all this and not think of it. And had Justin Turner not come back on the field, we would be sitting here and talking about what still needs to be talked about is how did Major League Baseball not centralize the testing sitting there right next to the, the stadium? How do they not have some rapid testing? How did they not hire some firm in the Metroplex that was going to handle this? How, how are they still shipping stuff off to Utah when, when everything's going down and you need to be buttoned up before the first pitch of a game. Like, literally, whoever's in charge of the protocol had to be sitting there saying, we are rolling the dice, putting this team out there for game six with without everything yeah. completely back and positive and, che- you know, negative and checked off. Like, how the hell did that happen? You know? <laughs> I, I, well, I, I, think, I think the answer is this. If you have, um, if you have somebody who you trust because they know 
the way that testing has gone all year long, and and you trust the accuracy, you trust the doctor involved, you trust everybody there, the instinct probably would be to stick with them and to stick with that lab. I, I understand. I do understand that instinct, and I think the rapid tests that you're talking about, which the the Dodgers were supposed, I, I'm pretty sure they took them when they got back to the hotel uh, early this morning, but. Uh, I think that the rapid tests don't have nearly the sensitivity that the the PCR uh, tests that they that they ended up taking do have, and so because of that, uh, I think they just stuck with the you know they stuck with the lab that got them there. Was that a right decision? Was that a wrong decision in hindsight? Uh, I, I think that's a fair thing to ask. And uh, I, let's put it this way: everyone uh, everyone was caught quite off guard and. There were a lot of very happy people, Rich, that the Dodgers came back and won that game because can you imagine what would have happened if Justin Turner had tested positive, the Rays had won, and Game 7 of the World Series was going to be postponed for at least two days and depending on the number of other positive Mm. tests could have been indefinitely just waiting around. And at what point then do you say, you know what, enough waiting We need to get this thing done. And you, Los Angeles Dodgers, need to just put your best team that you can field out there and play for the championship. I mean, man, that would have been – that would have been – this is a bad situation. That would have been a bad situation compounded. No doubt. Jeff Passan, a few minutes left with you. So let's get to the why the Dodgers did win game six. Um, Obviously, Mookie Betts being a complete difference maker – by um, hitting a double uh, once Blake Snell was lifted and then fast enough to cross the plate for the go-ahead run, even though the ball was hit directly to a slick fielding first baseman and then uh, providing the much-needed insurance run with a home run um, in the bottom of the eighth inning. That was uh, truly remarkable stuff. We know, again, Seager uh, getting the MVP award, but let's be honest, this is all going to be about the move that Kevin Cash made about lifting Blake Snell (laughs) Um, and, um, boy, uh, it, you know, we, uh, the hindsight is crystal. It's not even 2020, you know, whatever, whatever's better 2010, uh, the hindsight is clear crystal on this. Uh, what do you think this means for analytics writ large, anything, uh, that you want to hit on this subject? I give you the floor on that, Jeff. You know, I think, I, I think Tim Kirchin spoke pretty eloquently about it. And I don't know if you heard what he had to say, I did but not. He, he essentially, he essentially was saying that this is baseball run amok and, and that it's problematic. I want to, I want to, I, I don't disagree with Tim because I, I would have kept Snell in there just because I thought the quality of the stuff was still really sharp, but, but let's, let's go back 24 hours earlier, Rich, the Los Angeles Dodgers, are the Tampa Bay Rays with money. <laughs> now, they don't yes. they don't they don't do quite as many, you know, you're not going to see a four man outfield with the Dodgers and uh because they have that money, they have Clayton Kershaw and a bunch of other, you know, starting pitchers. Granted, there are other starting pitchers whether it's Julio Arias, Dustin May, uh Tony Gonsolin and Walker Buehler don't make a whole lot of money and they they haven't because they've drafted and developed really well. But point being they don't have to go to an opener. Um but what they did do is after Clayton Kershaw recorded two outs on two pitches, after Clayton Kershaw had pitched five and two thirds solid innings, Dave Roberts walked to the mound to a cascade of boos from fans in the stadium and took the ball away from a guy who's next to Sandy Koufax, uh, the best pitcher in franchise history. And, uh, you know, when he when it's all said and done, there may be an argument that he was even better than Sandy Koufax. And why did he do that? Because the analytics said so. So why are the Tampa Bay Rays getting absolutely raked over the coals today for doing the same thing? that the Los Angeles Dodgers did the day before. The, the two teams are not all that different. And I think, I think analytics are a very easy target for people because sometimes they're difficult to understand, and sometimes they don't jive with what our normal thoughts are. And our normal thoughts, I use that in quotations, are what we're used to, what we've grown up with, what we've grown accustomed to in this game that doesn't tend to change very quickly. Now, analytics can get things wrong, too. 
But analytics also got the Tampa Bay Rays to where they are. And I think ultimately that's what Kevin Cash was doing. Kevin Cash was not sitting here and saying, Blake Snell, I have a problem with what you've done. He's sitting here and saying, I'm in game six of the World Series against a team that is clearly more talented than mine is. Why am I here? I'm here because I have followed the code. The code is what got us here. The code is what puts players in the best position to perform. And you know what? It was wrong to take Blake Snell out. But, Rich, do we really know if Blake Snell would have continued to be productive going on? No, because the truth is, the truth is, when you pitch well, it doesn't mean you're going to. That's what we have to recognize. It's easy to sit here and second guess or to first guess this move because of what happened. But what if Nick Anderson came in and shut him down? What if Blake Snell kept giving up hits after he had given up a hit to Austin Barnes? I know these are hypotheticals. I understand that these are what ifs, but they're not out of the realm of possibility. In fact, I think if you look at the probability of these things, it's probably pretty similar to what actually did wind up happening. So, uh, yeah, I would have stuck with Blake Snell. Yeah, I think it was the right thing to do to stick with him. But to sit here and blame Kevin Cash and blame analytics and make them this boogeyman, I think is a disingenuous argument. Well, I I hear you, Jeff, but we here at the Rich Eisen Show uh, have noticed, and we even have a segment every Friday, that whenever you say something that you really believe but need to – say it in a certain way to believe it, it's going higher register. And you went higher register a lot right there, Jeff. You, you well, really had to go higher, higher register. register. Here, here's you the just thing, went Rich. really up there you, on you, that. You know? You, you, know, you know that I'm capable of arguing both sides <laughs> yes. of the point. If, 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 you, if you can't argue both sides of the point, then there's no point in having that argument. Jeff passing everybody. Well done. Hey man, uh, you are awesome at what you do. Um, you're you're outstanding in getting information and disseminating it, not in a conversation just like this, is, but also writing it. Your writing is outstanding, Jeff, and I see. I, I suggest everybody check out your game story from last night. And uh, it was no wonder. Um, I wasn't surprised when you when uh, I texted you this morning to come <laughs> on here that you said you had not slept, that you pulled an all nighter. That was truly remarkable writing and reporting. And I uh, let let this serve as the the glass of warm milk to tuck you into bed right now, Jeff, to get some rest. I can't wait. And thank you, Rich, for the kind, for the for the for the kind words. And uh, you're you're pretty good at what you do too. <laughs> I, I, I picked Amazing. up on that. Amazing. I yeah. picked up on that. Very good, Jeff. Thank you so much. <laughs> Take care of yourself. Get some rest, and we'll be chatting in the next couple of days because I'm sure this story is going to keep going on. Obviously, thanks for the call, Jeff. All right, fellas. Take care. That's Jeff Passan of ESPN on The Rich Eisen Show. Hey, you watched all the way to the end. Thanks for that. Watch more right here.